RDA committee here. So without further ado, I'm going to let Dominique handle the introductions. So Dominique, over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep, can hear you just fine. Okay, so hello everyone. I am Dominique Bourassa, Bibliographic Standards and Catalog Librarian at Yale University. As Chair of the North American RDA Committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first NORDAC Online RDA Update Forum. For those of you who do not already know, let me briefly introduce you. Oops, I don't have, sorry. Let me briefly introduce you to NORDAC. So NORDAC is the entity that was formed in January 1st, on January 1st, 2018, to represent the North American region on the RDA Steering Committee, the group responsible for maintaining resource description and access. Only North American communities that have implemented RDA can have representation on NORDAC. For now, those communities are in the United States, the American Library Association and the Library of Congress, and in Canada, the Canadian Committee on Cataloging, Bermuda, Greenland, and saint pierre et miquelon which are also part of North America, could potentially have representation of NORDAC if communities in these places choose to adopt RDA. The current membership of NORDAC includes two representatives each from ALA, CCC, and LC. I'll introduce uh, you to four of them shortly. In addition, the RDA Board National Institution representative for North America, currently Meredith Fletcher from Library and Archives Canada, serves as NORDAC ex-official member. NORDAC's charge is to formulate North American position on RDA proposal, discussion papers, and drafts, to keep the North American communities in form of RDA development and RSC decision, to select a member of NORDAC to serve as the North American regional representative to the RSC, to respond to other RSC initiatives as they arise, and to support the work of RSC by helping to identify possible members for the working group. Since its inception, NARDAC has made headway on all of these tasks. One of NARDAC's goals has been to develop effective interaction with the communities we represent. We want to be your support and information hub and to provide direction to those of you who want to assume training responsibilities. This is not always easy since we are only six members covering a rather large area and are not funded. Still, we realize that outreach is increasingly important as the new RDA toolkit is set to replace the original toolkit next December 15. Today's forum obviously is our way to reach out to as many North American RDA users as possible wherever you are. I'm therefore excited to see so many of you here today. So the goal of this forum is not to teach you in two hours how to catalog using the beta RDA toolkit, that would be impossible, but to tell you what has happened this year towards development of RDA and what you can expect in the foreseeable future. We've, we've prepared seven short presentations Recording of presentation will be posted on the RDA YouTube channel and slides on the RDA section of the RSC website. Please use the chat box to ask questions throughout the forum. Uh, we'll mostly answer all questions only at the end um, to make sure we have time to hear all presentations. Uh, but if you want a specific uh, speaker to answer your question, please indicate this in this chat box. That would be helpful. So let's get started. So uh, let me just uh, So our first presenter, oops, sorry, our first presenter uh, is Thomas Brendorfer, who is in his second term as the representative of NARDAC on the RDA Steering Committee. On NARDAC, Thomas is one of the two representatives uh, of the C Canadian Committee on Cataloging. He is also the author of RDA Essential and has worked as a cataloger since 1990, including over 25 years at the Guelph Public Library. Thomas will talk to us today about RDA Hot Topics. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. And hello, everyone. And thanks to all of you for attending this virtual RDA forum sponsored by the North American RDA Committee. I uh, just have to say there's a, a big thunderstorm that's just rolled in. So if you hear some sound effects, that's just mother, mother nature uh, punctuating my points here. Um, it's not quite the same as being in Chicago, uh, but NARDAC is certainly pleased to continue in its role of sponsoring the RDA forum through ALA twice a year. Now these twice a year updates are expected to be routine, especially as the RDA steering committee has moved to having four meetings a year, which correspondingly means there should be updates and new content to report on on a regular basis. Well, the past few months, I, I would say maybe there's been two categories of hot topics. One category is the remaining issues for the structure of the toolkit, and that includes ongoing translation and the incorporation of policy statements. It includes adding and filling out guidance chapters and looking at ways of incorporating community content. Now, by, by community, that also means considering RDA in the context of internationalization where the traditional Anglo-American cataloging aspects, while still there, are now in the context of the toolkit, being able to scale up effectively uh, to incorporate different languages, scripts, and community-specific vocabularies and conventions from around the world. Uh, a second category of hot topics from the last few months is the handful of remaining adjustments to elements and instructions that came about from aligning RDA with LRM, the library reference model. Among these last uh, handful are aggregates, which is the model that says that any manifestation that embodies two or more expressions is an aggregate. That includes augmentations of a main expression through, for example, adding illustrations or introductory text as well as um, aggregates which are compilations of say text or songs and so on. Now, a goal of RDA was to keep intact as many instructions as possible from before. With aggregates, many of our practices stay intact, but they are mapped a little differently in the update to the model. So with aggregates, there are many options or paths to take for various resources we catalog that are, that are aggregates. And I'll explore that a bit later in some of the later slides. Now, the RDA Steering Committee has gotten into its, its new tempo of meetings with three meetings a year conducted asynchronously with an online tool called Basecamp to post documents and recommendations and to provide written responses and to vote. One in-person meeting a year for the RSC has been the norm for a long time, but with the COVID-19 situation, the meeting set for Jerusalem in October has been converted into a virtual meeting with a planned mix of live meetings with GoToMeeting and asynchronous sessions using Basecamp. So let's go on to summarize some of the hot topics from the last three meetings. Well, back in January, there was a major decision made and that was with regard to the substantial number of instructions for constructing access points, which we refer to as string encoding schemes. Now, uh, the string encoding schemes, they are mo mostly for constructing access points, and they deal with the questions of what elements and designations to record, what order to record them in, and what punctuation to use. Now, some elements for access points in the beta toolkit have a lot of string encoding schemes, and examples are authorized access point for person, authorized access point for corporate body, authorized access point for work. Now, the, the, those current instructions are reflective of our current Anglo-American cataloging practice, but the RSC needed to consider what the toolkit would look like if other agencies around the world began to add their own instructions. So the choices were, were uh, uh, keep adding instructions for each community on, on these current web pages for access point elements, even though they would grow substantially. Uh, second choice was a more of a hybrid approach keep the conditions for the instructions, but then have all these links going out to separate pages for the more detailed uh, string encoding scheme instructions, or uh, move all of the detailed instructions for access points to policy statements, starting with policy statements for the Library of Congress and the British Library. So this, that was a decision that was made that was somewhat of a bigger step, 
but and you should see some of that effort uh, with the September release of the beta toolkit. At the January meeting, the RSC had some remaining elements and instructions to work out for aggregates. In the current toolkit, many, uh, many elements associated with aggregated content are treated as expression elements, but those expressions are not often brought out and described in detail. And these elements, such as illustrative content and supplementary content, are category of expression elements. And the decision made was to assign these at the manifestation level. Now, the method used for these elements is what's called the shortcut method, which means in lieu of creating descriptions for every single aggregated expression separately, we add to the description of the manifestation, which would be an aggregate manifestation, and use shortcut elements, which have built within them the definition and the implicit chain of relationships that point back to the categories for the aggregated expressions. Now, in the context of a mark record, this actually simplifies things a bit. If we take the mark record as primarily focused on recording manifestation elements, and I'll get into more of aggregates a bit later. Another topic at the January meeting was the updating of a guidance chapter for implementation scenarios. Now, there was a document on implementation scenarios that was over 10 years old, and so this was updated to account for linked data implementations. Other scenarios are still there, such as MARC, Scenario C, uh, Flat File Catalog, Scenario D. Now, the RDA elements are considered the anchor for these implementation scenarios. So no matter the implementation, we are seeing the results of recording values that come from RDA elements. So, and correspondingly, most RDA elements have several recording methods. We can refer to the same elements in different ways. And so a range of implementation scenarios are possible. So moving on to some hot topics from the April meeting. At the April me meeting, the RSC looked at a progress report from NARDAC on developing friendly labels for the, um, the reference labels for RDA elements which, as some of you are familiar, can be unwieldy, but are ultimately not intended for display for public users of catalogs. Now, the element reference labels serve as unique identifiers for each RDA element, and they are intended to be purely functional. Now, trying to come up with labels that work in each community internationally in each language is a potentially taxing exercise, and the direction the RSC is going is to see these friendly labels as community resource projects. Uh, labels are also things that ILS vendors take on when they design their catalog interfaces, but perhaps establishing a community curated list of friendly labels uh, may generate some consistency. At the April meeting, the RSC took a look at updating the resources tab in the new toolkit, and this is one of the remaining structural pieces that needed to be looked at in the 3R project. Uh, the discussion involved things like re the removal of Western bias, such as having instructions for books of the Bible, not be so upfront, uh, when these are among the many possible community or language specific vocabularies. Now, among the vocabularies that have become community vocabularies, uh, terms of rank, formerly titles of nobility, terms of rank, uh, et cetera, uh, collective title, gender terms, these are all very much community vocabularies. And the expectation is that if more are added, they would fit into this section. And the April meeting, uh, the uh, RC also uh, saw the last piece of the content elements in the aggregates puzzle. And I will go over to this uh, again in a bit more detail a bit later. At the July meeting, the last, uh, the most recent meeting, the RC continued to look at updating guidance material and the resources tab content. Um, a topic came up, uh, entity boundaries, and this topic deals with the question of uh, when do you need a new description for an entity, or does the data match an existing description? Now, there had been some guidance in the toolkit on making decisions for when new works needed to be described, but, suge uh, but suggestions for improvements to the toolkit led to the idea, why just limit ourselves to works when it comes to entity boundaries? We should present guidance on all of the entities such as uh, persons and corporate bodies and items. So the guidance is there um, um, for determining via policies as to what RDA elements are useful uh, to be used as a baseline for saying a different entity can be identified and described. Uh, there was some more decisions about the 
the uh, Resources tab Toolkit menu, and I'll, I'll show you some slides at the end about that. And also at the July meeting, there was a, another guidance document that was deemed useful to add to the toolkit, and that was uh, on what it means to be conformant with RDA or uh, to have well-formed data. Now, this is especially important as we move into a, a post-3R world in which RDA metadata can be expanded upon, implemented in different ways, with varying policy statements, perhaps mapped to different schema external to RDA, and ideally, we would want the data to still be interoperable, anchored on the RDA elements and their definitions. Um, while a lot has been made about how everything in the new toolkit is an option, those options are manageable because there's um, a nucleus around which we can build conformant data, and that nucleus is the, the metadata statement, which is framed in terms of the linked data uh, triple of subject, predicate, object. So conformance means that a metadata statement one describes an instance of an RDA entity, two has the value of an RDA element, and three, that value is compatible with RDA guidance and instructions. So an example of a metadata statement, um, manifestation, that's the entity that's represented by a bibliographic control number. The next part is the element, let's say has title proper, and then the third part is the value for that title proper, uh, so formed by following uh, instructions and policy statements. So each metadata statement has three parts, and these metadata statements are formed by the application of RDA instructions and guidance. Um, so one aspect of conformance points the way to future development in that if applications need more granular information, the RDA entities can be subtyped, subtyped and the RDA elements can also be subtyped. So for example, in regards to compliance with LRM, the library reference model, RDA itself added two subtypes of the LRM collective agent entity, and those were corporate body and family. There's also been RSC discussion around treating, con treating uh, conferences and events a bit differently, and the chief ways of doing this would involve subtyping the, the current entities like collective agent or perhaps corporate body. Or in the future, one could also take an RDA element and make it more granular. For example, the RDA element related place of person. Well, that could be subtyped into elements like place of education. And in this way, RDA could continue to be expanded for different applications. And it makes it easier if conformance guidelines are followed so there's some semantic consistency. So among the things the RSC is looking at for supporting conformance is uh, providing guidance in the toolkit itself, offering assistance to agencies and communities that ask for assistance, and perhaps creating some self-service checklists to determine levels of RDA conformance for communities and their applications. So I guess this is the educational piece of the presentation. It's a hot topic here. Um, so I'm going to talk about representative expression elements and their use for aggregating works. So a little bit of a refresher first. Now these elements are new to RDA and there are no mark fields at this point for these elements. So you'll have to imagine how these will work. So for representative expressions, the idea is that uh, works can also be thought of in terms of an original or a canonical expression. So when we think of Shakespeare's Hamlet, we would think of English to be the language of a representative expression. And those values uh, are among the criteria that could be used in gauging if we're dealing with a new work or a new expression of a work. So in this case, um, we can see, let's say there are four expressions. Two of them have the values of these uh, representative expression elements, language of expression, English, content type, text. And these are recorded at the work uh, level. Uh, with the description of the work entity. Now there's also the possibility that a specific expression uh, can be flagged as the representative one, although you would need to look at the description of that expression to find the values uh, that would make up uh, why it's representative. Uh, the one major point here, this is a very flexible idea of, of uh, the representative expression. And so the RSC looked at, uh, could it solve some other uh, problems around uh, aggregates? 
So as I mentioned earlier this year, the RSC spent some time looking at the remaining issues with aggregates and constant elements. And aggregates are defined at the manifestation level when we say a manifestation is an aggregate if it embodies two or more expressions. Again, that, that could mean one main expression and several little augmenting expressions, or it could be a compilation of, of several expressions. Uh, the intellectual effort to select and arrange those expressions is called an aggregating work. And yes, so that does mean the aggregating work is very expression is a very expression focused concept. Um, for example, in um, in the case of a compilation, we could we could describe that ag aggregating work in terms of the characteristics of the expressions that are aggregated. And so, an element that would make sense is in fact the existing one, the represented expression elements. They can be recorded with the description of the aggregating work and provide that useful information about expressions that you would want to have associated with that work. So consider, say, a, a compilation of texts that just happen to be bilingual, let's say. There's two languages for them. Um, so there's two values for the language of represented expression. Now, say maybe the same works could be published, but the second language might be Spanish. So in that case, uh, the language of represented expression would be English and Spanish. Now, one issue what, or one question that comes up uh, occasionally with this is that if these aggregating works are really emphatically tied to the expressions and small differences means different aggregating works, what about the collocation function where we can use one access point to connect all of these different compilations? Well, there is another access point that can be used, including for aggregating works, and that's called the authorized access point for workgroup, which is very much a, a catalogers tool to bring together and to collocate uh, multiple works. And it has some use cases in, in other situations as well. So uh, looking at another case here, for these values of aggregated content, in some cases we look at their accumulation, such as duration of expressions added together, such as for each song in an album. So let's say if the uh, durations uh, vary for albums of the same, song, same songs, then that's actually where maybe a work group concept is helpful. And some of you may have seen some past presentations from RSC members where we've used the example uh, Beatles, Rubber Soul, as an, as an example of an access point for work group. And that's a, an access point that can refer to many different aggregating works, i.e. many different albums where there are slight differences in the content. So I'll wrap up with a couple more slides. I mentioned I would just show you a few slides about the resources menu tab. So this is the resources tab in the current beta toolkit, which is being revamped. Um, so if you look at here, we see all kinds of different things, additional instructions for names of persons, initial articles. Um, those are really related access point construction and would really fall under the string encoding schemes. Capitalization has more to do with transcription. And so that's a bit of a different section. And then there's a question of, as this grows, you know, what is this going to look like with all sorts of menus and submenus and so on? So the hopefully and hopefully you'll see some of this uh, these changes in the September beta release where we'll have this form where the menu is going to be very simple uh, and a lot of that heavy content and organization will be on on a landing page. Uh, the RSC decided on community resources as a heading. And here there'll be the, the many terms and conventions that are specific to languages and cataloging communities. Uh, capitalization is considered uh, uh, mostly under the context of a normalized description and instructions for initial articles and also instructions for names of persons, such as surname order and so on, part of string encoding schemes. But there are also some uh, uh, discussion about linking it to IFLA's name of person efforts that, that overlap with, with these ideas. So that's the end of my presentation. I don't see any questions.
No, so I think we should just move on anyway. So, but thank you so much for letting us know everything that has happened uh, since the beginning of this year. So we'll move on with Melanie. So if you can, okay, you've passed the ball. Thank you. Yep. So yeah. our next presenter is Melanie, uh, Melanie Paluta. And Melanie is currently a cataloging policy speci specialist in the police policy training and cooperative programs division at the Library of Congress. Having previously served for many years as a cataloger of Spanish language materials, she serves, at, she serves as one of the two LC representatives to NARDAC. She is also the project lead on the current project to move the LC PCC policy statements from the original RDA toolkit to the beta RDA toolkit and develop all related documentation. So Melanie will talk uh, to us today about this complex project. Thank you, Dominique. So I am definitely going to be doing a very brief, high-level overview of this uh, project. And I will note that um, I'll be providing a link at the end to another presentation that is very similar to this one, but actually goes into more depth in some of the uh, work that we're doing, because this one has to be very high level and short. So what is this basic project? As Dominique noted, this is where we are changing all of our documentation to work with the beta RDA toolkit that will be going live in December. What is involved in that is not just the policy statements, but also working on uh, developing the application profile that we are going to use as our basis and the metadata guidance documentation, which is all the external documentation um, that will be working with it. So both of these are going to be very large pieces of documentation, and therefore they will be taking us quite a bit of time to develop. And as a result, it's very important to note that the December 15th day in which RDA Toolkit is uh, released, it is not the date of implementation. Um, a great deal of this documentation that we are in control of will not be ready at that point in time. Now, since this is LC and PCC documentation, we presented a plan to the policy committee last November and they agreed to that overall approach. And that included regular monthly status reports and also discussions about major policy decisions that we needed to make as we looked at the, how deeply um, the beta toolkit changed things. Now, as you know, it was a radically different organization. And four areas where we had major changes were within these four that are listed here. And so this is one area where LC and TCC addressed this topic together by forming four joint task groups um, on these four topics. We started last September and have been working hard on doing these um, Ever since, three out of the four had presented their final reports, and you can see them on the PCC website. Each one made recommendations about how to approach the writing of the policy statements related to these topics, and LC and PCC have discussed them and come to agreements on what we're going to implement, how we're going to do it, and whether or not we are not going to do those recommendations, because I, they were, after all, just recommendations. So. Who is doing all of this work? Well, as Dominique noted, I'm a member of the Policy, Training, and Cooperative Programs Division, and we are the ones leading the effort. But we could not do this alone. It is far too big a job. We are getting a great deal of assistance from many LC catalogers and from PCC's POCO. So here is actually a list of the names in LC who are working on it. Um, Judith Cannon is our chief and is uh, definitely helping us manage the whole project. Clara Liao, who is the um, head of my section, and I'm not going to try to say that because I'm suddenly forgetting my own section name. Uh, <laughs> she is keeping us all on assignment. And then, of course, I am working as the project lead. Now, Ivy Glendon is also our project management resource, and I am working very closely with her to keep things organized and um, working hard on that. Here's the list of the PTCP members, but as I stated, we do have a great deal of assistance from other people in LC. Um, Damien Isaminger, who is from the music division, and these six um, catalogers from the frontline cataloging divisions at LC. We really could not do it without them. And then, of course, we will be bringing in other special formats catalogers as we uh, want to consult on specific issues. Now, one of the biggest things about this project as we tackled it is the realization that this is really six separate projects um, that are all 
a big puzzle pieces of this one big project. And we really need to get through most, if not all of them, before we truly implement. Um, but that date of implementation is what POCO and LC will be deciding on at a later point. Now, let's look at the actual phases. Phase one is the analyze policy statements. And this one is really foundational because this is where we look at the existing policy statements. We take them apart, we put them back together in relationship to the beta toolkit and how it's organized. And then we go and look at the beta toolkit and look at each option and instruction that it has. And we'd make the decision, are we going to apply this one or not? Because one of the things that we have to remember is that what the current RDA toolkit states as an instruction, the new one states as a option. And so we have to make a statement with the policy statements, we are going to implement this option or not. In both of these stages, we are setting up a process where one cataloger does the analysis and the writing, another one proofreads that person's work, they review it, they say, okay, is it linked to where it needs to be linked? Does it say what it needs to be said? And it, then um, they make comments and then the original writer will finalize those. Now, all of that is the preparation for phase two in which we put it all into the data markup in the content management system. So there are six of us, uh, most of us overlapping with the rest of the group who are working on the DITA. Right now, we are studying DITA as a group and because it is a new process for us, it's a new kind of markup, but it is based on an XML standard. And fortunately, all of us have some experience with XML. We did put in a batch of test policy statements that you can find in the beta toolkit right now. Uh, one of them, for example, is on L um, on content type and another one on statement of responsibility. And so those were a test case to see what we liked about display and how we wanted to do the data markup that underlies that display. Um, and part of our discussions is, of course, that we're working out best practices uh, for making sure that we don't repeat the work, overlap the work, and all that kind of stuff when phase one is done. We are also um, have an application profile that we're going to be producing in phase three. We have a format for it. Uh, we've worked out a me methodology for how to handle it, uh, but we haven't gotten deep into that. Now, phases four, five, and six are not yet started because they depend on these two, the first two previous phases. However, I will note that um, those of us who are kind of in charge, we have already started thinking about these because we need to be ready to go as soon as that next stage hits and our other workers are ready to go on them. So while we haven't started those, we have definitely started organizing for them. Now this has been a very challenging project up to this point and will continue to be highly challenging. It's very complex work and the other presentation I minted um, has a section that really talks about how complex it can be to do this analysis of the policy, policy statements. In addition, this project did grow. As Thomas mentioned, the string encoding scheme decision suddenly landed a bunch of decisions in our lap that previously were not there. So we are figuring out how to handle those. And then of course, the pandemic did have an impact on us. However, I am very happy to say that um, I think the LC employees really rose to the challenge, as did PCC POCO. Uh, we as much as possible have stayed in, in contact. We've been working closely together. And it, over about a month, it took us to, to really adjust, but, and that slowed us down a bit. But we really did, I think, rose to the occasion and continue to produce a lot of high quality work. So this has been and continues to be a truly challenging, maddening, and exciting, exhausting, and interesting work. And, but I'm very glad to be a part of it, and I look forward to the challenge of finishing it on time. So thank you for your attention, and please note here that there is this link at the bottom that I mentioned is to another presentation similar to this topic, and it will um, go into more detail that we don't really have time to do here. Okay. Thank you, Let's, Melanie, for yeah. telling us about this exciting project. Let's Very now exciting. move on to Canada. We'll cross the border yes. with our next yes. presenter. Tran. So Tran joined Library and Archives Canada in 2016 as a cataloging librarian for ISSN Canada in serials mm -hmm. publications. She's currently acting team leader for the French and government monograph team. She serves as one of two representatives from the Canadian Committee on Cataloging to NARDA. Tran will describe the work that LAC is doing to get ready for the implementation of the beta RDA toolkit. 
She will present uh, in English, but her slides will be posted in English and French. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you all for attending. My name is Tran, and I would like to give you some updates from Library and Archives Canada regarding uh, the preparation uh, for the new RDA toolkit. So let's move. So first, I just want to give you a little reminder of the context uh, within which uh, LDC is uh, working in. Uh, as you all know, LDC is a bilingual national institution with French and English as the official languages. We have a policy on bilingualism and our description work uh, have to reflect that. And part of our practice is that we create bibliographic and authority records in French for French uh, public language publications, English records for English language publications, and both French and English records for publications that are bilingual. Uh, over the past few years, uh, we have seen some major changes in the way that we work. Uh, as you all know, uh, Library and Archives Canada have recently moved uh, our library system from the in-house amicus to OCLC's World Share Management Services. Uh, this change provided us with the opportunity to transition to the NAME Authority Cooperative Program, NACO, uh, to manage our English language authority records. And uh, to support that, uh, we have created a new module within the WMS, uh, the Canadian NAME Authorities in French, uh, to house our French language authorities. And this uh, Canadian uh, file uh, will also form the basis for the new PFAN program. So what is the PFAN? PFAN stands for P a Francophone Name Authority Program, or Programme Francophone des Autorités de Nom in French. It's a new program that uh, allows uh, some libraries to contribute directly and collectively to the Canadian file. And as a reminder, uh, up until now, uh, the Canadian file has been exclusively um, managed by LAC. The program is the result of a collaborative effort between LAC, Bibliothèque et Archives Nationales du Québec, as well as 15 French language university libraries in Quebec. The program uses the NACO model as the basis for its government um, structure, uh, its program, and its policy, and it has been officially launched in June of this year. Currently, the Standard Committee is working to develop a set of documents to support the work of uh, the new PFAN members. So what does all this change mean? It means that since uh, LEC's transition to OCLC's World Share Management Services, our catalogers have been working with two distinct files for uh, authorities, uh, LEC NACO for the English language authorities, as well as the Canadian uh, PFAN uh, file for the French language authorities. Uh, uh, we are also working with three different files for subject headings, the Library of Congress subject headings, the Canadian subject headings, uh, which are available in Canadian uh, inside of WMS, as well as the French language Répertoire de Vedette Matière, which also has been added to uh, WMS recently. So as you can imagine, this large inventory of files will have an impact on the scope of instructions that LEC would have to establish. So currently, um, our uh, policy statements in the current uh, RDA toolkit will need to be revised. They're available now in both French and English as per our policy on bilingualism. Um, however, they make reference to the old library system, Amicus, and do not necessarily reflect the current environment. Um, also, LEC shares uh, some of our policy statements with the NQ, and it is expected that the current structure will be more or less conserved in the new toolkit. So for the new policy statement in the new RDA toolkit, there's a couple of principles that we have to follow. Uh, first, as per our policy on bilingualism, uh, the policy statement must be made available in both French and English simultaneously. Furthermore, they must be aligned to LC and PCC, as well as the new PFAN, 
all while being specific to Canada and LAC where needed. Finally, they must uh, take into account the new work environment, that is the uh, OCLC's WMS, as well as our collaboration with uh, BNQ for the creation of policy statements in French. So this is a preliminary list of actions that we have to undertake in order to develop our policy statement in the new RDA toolkit. Uh, note that this list is not at all exhaustive, but it's meant to give you uh, some idea of the things that have to happen before we implement the new toolkit. So we have to plan the work as well as the implementation date, uh, do an analysis of the current policy statement in relation to the new RDA toolkit, write and revise the English text of statements that are specific to Canada and LEC, and have those statements um, translated into French. We also have to write new French text for of policy statements for the new PFAN and have those uh, policy statements translated into English. Finally, we would have to create the statement in the RDA toolkit and collaborate with um, BNQ uh, for the French statement. Obviously, uh, all throughout this process, we will make sure to communicate with the Canadian library community uh, of all of our plans and progresses. Um, so just a side note on the application profile. Uh, we have started work to analyze that our working environment and to get an idea of the cataloging tools that will be used by our description staff. Uh, furthermore, Elizabeth Sander, our acting manager of the description, is a member of the application profiles working group. So in conclusion, given the other priorities that we have for 2020-2021, such as the PFAN program, uh, the schedule of the French translation of the RDA toolkit, as well as our need to align with policy statement that will be produced by LC and PCC, uh, Library and Archives Canada will not be implementing the new RDA toolkit on December 15. Uh, we will determine our implementation schedule this fall, and we will make sure to communicate this own information to the library community in due time. So thank you very much for your attention. Is there any questions? So I think, Tran, we're going to move on. I don't see any question anywhere at this point, but we're going to move on and keep our questions um, for the end. But thank you for telling us about everything you have to do. It's quite a lot. <laughs> Okay, so let's continue our program with Danielle Paradis. Danielle has been working in the Cataloging Directorate for Heritage Collection at Bibliothèque et Archives Nationales du Québec since August 2011, first in the position of Music Cataloging Librarian, and since November 2015 in the position of Bibliographic Standards Librarian. He is a member of the Canadian Committee on Cataloging and a member of the RDA Steering Committee where he serves as the RDA translation team liaison officer. Danielle will talk to us about translating the new RDA toolkit into French, and I'm sure his presentation will be of interest not only to North American French speakers, but also to anyone interested in translation of the toolkit. Hi, uh, Dominique, thank you very much, and um, hello everyone. I'm sorry that I have a little uh, problem uh, uh, Switching to uh, the next uh, slide, so uh, if you... Uh, I think if you click on the thumbnail first, and then the arrow down. Yeah, all the way on the left, there's that menu. Okay, just a minute. And I'm sorry. That's all right, there's a scroll bar there if you want to go back down to where your slide is. Yes. Okay, so there we are. Sorry for this uh, little uh, mishap. So uh, in this presentation, I will give an overview of how the 3R project helped uh, make the translation process, process more efficient. I will also address some of the issues that we encountered when working on the French translation of the new toolkit. So when we began, uh, working on the French translation of RDA back in 2010, we started with simple tools, that is, word files for the chapters, the appendices, and the glossary. 
We were also provided with a word file of recurring phrases that we translated at the beginning of the process to ensure consistency between translations. Sorry. So, issues with, uh, that's it. Okay, thank you, sorry. So, uh, several steps have been uh, taken over the years to uh, automate the production of uh, RDA Toolkit's content, including the translations. One of the objectives of the 3R project was to implement a process to synchronize RDA translations with RDA reference data in the RDA registry so that labels, definitions, and scope notes for elements and vocabularies, which appear in instructions, the glossary, and the appendices, could be automatically pulled from the registry. Uh, sorry. So the use of our, uh, registry data was further expanded in the new toolkit. Um, it is currently used to populate parts of entity and element pages, the glossary and uh, vocabulary encoding schemes. The same will happen uh, with the translation, of course. For translation teams, this involves updating their translation of RDA reference since the English version was extensively revised and expanded in part to support the LRM. This is a significant project that a few teams have uh, completed, uh, but that others, including the French team, are still working on. I realize that I uh, skipped a little bit here on the previous uh, slide. so. Uh, in this, uh, we saw uh, when we uh, I talked about uh, the translation, the synchronization process. So it was first used in the English version in 2016 and was implemented for translations in 2017 in the current toolkit. And in order to do that, translation teams uh, had to provide translations of RDA reference using templates in CSV format that were later uploaded to the registry. So this slide shows an example of a, tem a template, in this case, the one for the extension plan vocabulary. Uh, so I said that uh, uh, registry, uh, the RDA registry data will be uh, pulled and uh, input into the, the instructions. So uh, uh, it will also uh, happen with the examples. So registry data will be used in parts of examples the slide shows here a view of a, a, a view in context example where the elements, element names in the left column and the term spoken word in the right column were pulled from the registry. This means that translators will not have to translate these terms again when working on the examples. It is also interesting to note that examples are now grouped in separate files, which should give translators more flexibility if they want to replace or delete existing ones or add new ones. During the 3R project, translators also began working with uh, SDL Trado Studio, which is a computer-assisted translation tool. It includes tools such as a translation memory and terminological databases to speed up the translation process and increase uh, its quality. We are now also using SDL Trado Scoop Share, which is a cloud-based product that allow teams that allows teams sorry to share translation memories and terminological databases among themselves. As you know, all the element chapters follow the same structure as outlined on the slide. To avoid having to translate the same section headings hundreds of times, the headings will be translated only once in a table in RDA's uh, content management system. The table will then be used to insert the French headings in the French files that translators will be working on later. Uh, Melanie mentioned it. Uh, the, another ob objective of the 3R project was to convert the RDA data toolkit to the data format that Melanie mentioned, which was implemented in 2017. The boilerplate file, as we call it, is an example of how the data format improved content management and the translation process. The file contains sentences and paragraphs that are frequently reused in the RDA text, 
It is in fact an improved and more granular version of the recurring phrases document that I mentioned earlier. So when needed in a specific instruction, boilerplate text is pulled into RDA instructions using content references or content key references. Reuse content is therefore only translated once, and if revisions or corrections are needed, they will only need to be done once. The boilerplate file contains more than 250 sentences or paragraphs, of which the slide shows a very small sample. The fact that conditions and options are formulated as completely separate sentences in the new toolkit helps take advantage of the boilerplate technique. As of May uh, 26, RDA had a little more than 3,000 elements. Instructions for 84% of the elements are composed entirely of boilerplate and will be translated automatically. The element printer agent of is one of these elements. This means that only instructions for 481 elements, that is 16%, will have to be translated by a translator. Uh, I'll now uh, we'll move on to some of the issues that we uh, uh, experienced or encountered during translation. Uh, one issue was that, that we had to tackle when translating RDA reference was the remove, removal of parentheses in element names. In the current toolkit, parentheses are used to qualify similar labels by uh, element range, but, but this practice was found inconsistent and confusing in the English version and was discontinued. In English, it's not too difficult to remove the parentheses and produce a satisfactory result uh, without changing the word order. But this does not work so easily in French, where removing the parentheses requires changing the word order and using an adjective. Appropriate adjectives are not always available, and those that are uh, may sound pedantic or inappropriate, as seen on the slide. Changing the word order also means that the most significant word will no longer be the first, which is not an issue in English. It was therefore decided to retain parentheses in some instances for consistency and to keep a more useful order where the entry is under the specific term and not the entity. Another uh, ish, uh, issue uh, that we encountered was uh, uh, some ed editorial in nature, because one probably never looks at a text more closely than when one has to translate it, and RDA translators have proved to be good proofreaders. During the process of translating RDA reference, we encountered and reported several editorial problems, such as typos and inconsistencies between similar definitions. We also made suggestions to revise the English text whenever a clarification was needed to produce an accurate translation. We also reported more significant problems with some of the definitions. For example, the element coordinates of cartographic content was an attribute in the original toolkit, but became a relationship element in the beta toolkit with place as range. The original definition in the beta toolkit did not reflect the change by defining the element as a place, but this was fixed during the 3R project. The word issue and its cognates raise, uh, raised problems too. Uh, their meanings are maybe more difficult to grasp for a francophone. For example, does issuing cover only publication? Most reference sources consulted seem to suggest so, but its usage in RDA and in terms such as issuing body agent seem to indicate otherwise. Uh, what is the distinction between publication, release, and issuance in a scope, scope note such as the one for name of publisher, which reads, publication includes release and issuance? This distinction seems uh, subtle enough to confuse Google Translate, which suggested back in July 2019, a translation that meant Publication includes publication and publication. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the French translation team still has some work to do to complete the translation of RDA reference. Over the past year, we have had to devote time and resources to another, another major project uh, that Trend mentioned, that is the uh, PFAN uh, 
program, and this forced us to put the translation on hold for a while. We therefore still have several steps to go through, as seen on the slides. We set uh, the, the end of May 2021 as our target date to complete the translation of the new RDA. So if you want to learn more about the original French translation project, uh, you can refer to the article that Clément Arsenault, Pat Riva, and I wrote for uh, Cataloging and Classification Quarterly in 2014. Thank you, that's, Daniel, that's, for this informative uh, presentation. You're most welcome. Uh, so let's move on with uh, James Henley. So um, James is the director of RDA Toolkit. He oversees all aspects of RDA Toolkit, including development, production, marketing, and customer service. And just will give us updates on the beta RDA Toolkit. Are you here, Jamie? <laughs> Yeah, it looks like you're still muted, Jamie. I forgot to mute, mute myself. Look at that. How embarrassing. Um, so I'm here, and um, I'm going to give you a quick rundown on uh, what we have planned for the RDA Toolkit release. The next one to the beta site will be September 16th. Um, it'll include um, much of the uh, uh, items you see listed here. Uh, there will be partial translations of Finnish and Norwegian. So um, the reason it's finished in Norwegian is because they had the time and resources to get this work done, put um, a little more energy into this translation work, et cetera. So that's why it's finished in Norwegian, no other, other reason than that. Um, they are partial translations in that they, uh, these translation teams have completed the RDA reference um, translation, which is largely the um, glossary translation, if you will. Um, and they've translated that uh, boilerplate file that uh, some of our other speakers have mentioned before. That boilerplate file, I think Danielle mentioned it, um, contains a lot of commonly used um, sentences, et cetera, and throughout the toolkit. So once you finish those two things, as um, I think Danielle mentioned, uh, you've got about 2,400 files completed. So those are done. And then you're going to have um, parts, significant parts of other files also translated. Um, that includes the element reference piece, uh, the uh, related elements piece that you find on element pages, et cetera, like that. And then wherever there is um, material that is boilerplate or um, pulled in from the registry reference translation uh, will appear in um, the Finnish or Norwegian translation. The rest of the material that they haven't been able to get to will appear as English in those translations. So you'll see some files that are mixed, um, Finnish or Norwegian and English. Um, the Finns are working on the guidance chapters, so those will may be very close to done or fully translated um, for the September release. We'll see how that works out. And they have, um, both teams have translated the user interface for the beta site. So navigating the toolkit will be done, uh, can be done in their native language. And also what's important about this is, is these are our first translations on the beta toolkit. And so we'll be testing out the functionality of how you can switch languages, how easily you can switch languages and set preferences for language, et cetera. So those was, uh, those, that's a really big component and one of the last really big components of um, the work on the beta site. Uh, we're making some improvements to the contributed documents area, making sure that functions properly, particularly there are a lot of issues with the subscribe function and so this is again kind of like one of the very last things that we're really building out for the beta site is this um, sharing of documents and subscribing to institutions or documents um, that are posted on the toolkit. Um, so we hope to get that cleaned up and a lot more user-friendly by the September release. 
there will be additional policy statements from uh, LCPCC and the British Library. Um, it's not going to be a ton of them. It's going to be a few more as they continue their work, as they continue to kind of really, at this stage, we're still working through the process of how to um, approach writing policy statements and get them onto the toolkit. So this is kind of the continuation of that process. But you should see um, more policy statements um, from both uh, LC and British Library. Uh, most of them are likely to be related to manifestation, but um, we'll see about that. And then I think Thomas mentioned um, the RC plans to restructure the resources tab, and that will be reflected um, in the September release. The, there'll be a bit of a reshuffling around um, of the resources tab, and with the rollout on the 16th, we'll have more information about that, including um, including uh, uh, some um, videos on how to, where things moved on the resources tab, et cetera, like that. So that September release will be the final release to the quote unquote beta site. And that's because the next release in December is the switchover. So the focus on the switchover will be to really um, minimize development and editorial work and to really be focused on the physical switchover that is moving the beta site to access.rdatoolkit.org, which is right now has the original RDA content. And the beta.rdatoolkit.org site will go away. That address will no longer be active. However, one of the primary goals in this switchover is that we're not going to break any links. No links that you made to the beta site will be broken. And our goal is no links that you made to the um, access.rdatoolkit.org site will be broken. All your links in your documentation will hopefully be fine. Now, I can't promise 100%, but we're going to try and get to as close to 100% as we can. Um, the reason we are able to do this is these links are based on IDs within um, each individual site, the original site and the beta site. And um, those IDs are not similar at all. So they shouldn't, there shouldn't be any conflict when we um, change the domains um, of those two sites. The original content will move to a new address um, probably, I haven't settled on that. It'll be something like original.rda toolkit or something like that. Um, there'll be an announcement about that um, well, uh, well before um, the December switchover date. Uh, the December switchover date, I forgot to include that here, is December 15th. I should add that. Um, so that's uh, most of kind of what we're working towards. Under, uh, I'm sure Kathy who follows me will uh, <laughs> will reiterate this point, but we are not taking down the um, original toolkit site at any planned time right now. And when we do decide to take it down, it will be you will have a one year notice on that. So you should operate on this December 15th switchover like. I still have access. You can still use the original toolkit site for the foreseeable future. And you will get notification when the future is now no longer foreseeable for it. Okay. So you will have plenty of time to know about that. And I believe that's all I have. So Thank I you. pass it to Steve, it looks like. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. I'm sure a lot of sure. people are happy to know the original toolkit is not disappearing on December 15. So our next yeah. presenter is Stephen Hearn. He's metadata strategist at the University of Minnesota Libraries and one of ALA's representatives to NARDAC. He is an ECO liaison and trainer and is active in PCC and ALA community, uh, sorry, committees focused on cataloging standards. Stephen will talk to us today about RDA conformance in a complex environment. Um, just a moment, do I get my 
do I advance the slides? I thought I did that. Hi, Stephen. You're all set. Okay. Which button should I press to advance the slide? All the way on the left, uh, you'll see that menu. Ah. Or you can click the down arrow or click those oh, squares okay. to get the thumbnails. I, I, was, I was missing the arrows. Now I see it. Um, Thomas earlier mentioned uh, RDA conformance as a topic at the July meeting. Uh, the proposal that was discussed was an RDA discussion paper uh, put out in May. We, some of us in NARDAC had a meeting online with some of the people from RSC about the paper. Uh, the link there at the bottom of this screen is the link to that paper about RDA conformance. The paper discusses the degrees of metadata conformance with RDA, uh, what it means that, uh, that something is or is not conformant, um, and the goal ultimately at that point anyway is that this uh, discussion paper would be worked into the what's now the data elements guidance chapter it would become uh, <clears throat> somewhat reconfigured to to deal with conformance issues as well as the basics of data elements and i like I like this discussion of conformance for two reasons: one is it sort of clarifies for all of us what it means when r d a uh, is used when we say that a given description is r d a conformant but also because it helps us see RDA in its role, and its role is a limited one in the larger context of cataloging, where we are discussing aspects of resources which are not a concern for RDA, and we're doing it with tools which are outside of RDA, and that's fine. That's you know not conformant with RDA, but there's parts of cataloging that just aren't going to be conformant with RDA, and we have tools for those too. In terms of RDA, what are the degrees of conformance? RDA recognizes indirect conformance. There's simple conformance would be that I have a metadata statement that uses an RDA uh, element as its predicate, and the entities uh, in the domain and range are RDA entities, or they are values which RDA can recognize. That's, that's an RDA conformance statement. You start getting into multiple statements, description sketch, and it gets more complicated. Some uh, well, let's, let's go back to indirect conformance first. In indirect conformance, instead of using an RDA predicate uh, element, I use something else, but my something else is narrower and consistent with the definition of an RDA element. So the example in the discussion paper was I could have an element which discusses a, an adult or a child, but both of those are persons, so I could uh, dumb up, as Gordon von Seyer says, that element into uh, a, an aspect of person. Birth date of child could be birth date of person in RDA. And then I have something that's indirectly conformant. It's you know adaptable to be fully in conformance with RDA with some loss of granularity. Partial conformance means that there's a mix of RDA and non-RDA metadata in the package describing a resource or an entity. And this is what we see when we think about MARC records. We see that some of the metadata in a MARC record is conformant with RDA. And some of it, like subject aspects, has almost nothing to do with RDA because it's not about RDA entities. It's about concepts and things that are outside of RDA. And that's okay. That's partial conformance. And one of the points that was made in our PCC discussion, and it's clearly in the paper, is that the unconstrained element set, which is in the RDA registry, is not an RDA vocabulary. It's for non-RDA expression of metadata that originates in RDA, but needs to be expressed in terms that are not reliant on the distinctions that are crucial to RDA. The work expression manifestation item distinctions, uh, different various types of agents. When you have a description set which you know, dispenses with those distinctions as the unconstrained element set that's in the RDA registry does, 
you're no longer dealing with RDA. You're dealing with a sort of transitional vocabulary between to interoperate with another vocabulary which does not follow RDA principles, the principles in the LRM. Meanwhile, <laughs> we work in an environment that's more complicated than just a, the RDA uh, content standard. So I, to me, the, the context for cataloging involves an intersection of three different systems or standards. Uh, there's a content standard which says what to describe and how to describe it. And that we had in AACR2, that we have in RDA now and in RDA to come. We have an encoding format, which has been marked for most of us, uh, which is how you mark up the data so that you can tell what kind of data each piece is and how it relates to some other piece of metadata. RDF, Resource Description Framework, is the fundamental architecture of RDA and of BibFrame and of Dublin Core. And it's a much simpler syntax than what we see in MARC, but it's another way of encoding, of separating out the, the roles of language into domain, predicate, and object. And then there's the automated system that puts all this to work. Uh, automated systems like OCLC, and in our case, like Alma, and uh, there's lots of automated systems out there. Not as many as there used to be, but there's lots of them still. And none of these things, the content standard, the encoding format, and the automated system, turn out to be fully congruent or compatible with each other. There are loose ends that each of these uh, discovers when it gets integrated with the other. For that reason, I think we can take some comfort that indirect and partial conformance, especially partial conformance with YRDA, will be widely practiced. I mean, that's the only way uh, we're likely to go until we actually adopt RDA itself, its element set as our encoding format, and have automated systems, which I haven't seen yet, which fully adopt and uh, leverage all the features of RDF for describing our resources. So partial conformance. And this <clears throat> leads to a concern that some people have had about RDA, about whether it's a closed world system, which is to say everything that you describe with RDA has to be within the world of RDA in order to work with it. Or is it an open world system? Can it interact with pieces of metadata, entities, et cetera, that are outside the domain of RDA. And <clears throat> there's a lot of the language of RDA that suggests that it's a much more severe system than some people would be comfortable with. You have the RDA entity classes. You have the constrained elements. All of this language is, makes us think of something that is sort of bound and maybe in a closed world for that reason. But Linked data, and RDA is clearly a linked data uh, oriented system. Linked data uses identifiers to identify entities. And RDA does not require that the entity descriptions, which those identifiers lead to, be RDA entity descriptions, only that they reference RDA entities. If a person is an RDA entity, and I have a description of a person, meets the RDA requirements, doesn't have to be expressed in RDA, I can use that set of metadata as and its identifier to make an RDA statement. I can say that person identified by an ISNI ID or a VOF ID or whatever, as long as I'm satisfied that that description and the entity it represents clearly fall within the class that RDA is defining for that element, I can use that foreign identifier referencing a foreign description set with the RDA element and an RDA uh, range statement. So in this sense, RDA recognizes the potential for equivalent or compatible element semantics. Um, the fact that, again, we, we have the indirect conformance where uh, a predicate can actually be compatible with what RDA would rec recognize uh, indicates that it's more open to being integrated and interoperable with other systems and not simply a closed world of RDA pure, 
purity. And just finding the fact that RDA accepts partial conformance as something that is you know, within the realm of appropriate action, appropriate behavior, tells us that RDA is not trying to uh, you know, rule everything. More, RDA wants to be a, a part of the way we describe things that is logically coherent and based on, on observed user needs and provides us with good descriptive information. And where does that leave us? Well, to me, cataloging is a practical activity. We're, we're describing real things for real people using real systems. It's, it's not abstract and theoretical the way a lot of the logic of RDA is. And our job is to use these various systems that we uh, are given to make the metadata that will respond to user needs. We want our metadata to be able to be communicated and shared. So we like to use systems. We like to use standards so that the metadata that is useful in my system can be brought into the next system we operate on or brought, shared over to other people who might use other systems. That's what uh, one of the big values of having things like MARC, things like AACR, things that will give us enough commonality that we can share our metadata, and things like RDA. And our goal as the catalogers are is to use the strengths of the standards and the formats and the systems that we operate with and le leverage them all together so that they, they work in a way that's of practical value to users of libraries and to maintainers of the cultural record. And sometimes I think this can feel like we're we're being given uh, a basketball and a hockey stick and a soccer field and told to go out there and give it our all. And we do. And that's, that's the great thing. In the end, it's this cataloging activity and then the needs of users, which are the engine, which are the drivers of all of this activity. And RDA is part of that. RDA conformance has real advantages in terms of being able to infer things and be clear about the classes of things that you're describing. Uh, but it's not the only semantic game we play when we're out there on the field. We, we deal with subjects. We deal with circulation status, which is not part of RDA. We deal with administrative status, which is not part of RDA. So when we talk about conformance, we're only talking about a part of the, the larger context that we all operate in. And I believe uh, that's and I just changed the size, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for this informative talk. So let's move on to our last uh, uh, lecture for today. So our last presenter is Kathy Glennon. I like to call her the Grandmaster of RDA. Kathy has, Kathy has been a member of the RD Steering Committee and or its predecessor since 2013. She became chair in 2019. Con she serves as head of original and special collection, uh, special collections cataloging at the University of Maryland, and is UMD's NACO coordinator. She is a music cataloging specialist with more than three decades of experience and was a founding member of NARDAC. Kathy is here to answer a very important question that many of us are asking. 3R is almost done. What's next? Thank you, Dominique. For those of you who don't remember what 3R stands for, it was the RDA Restructure and Redesign Project. It started several years ago, and it's really exciting to be at the point where we're talking about it being done. But of course, RDA development work is never really done. So as you heard from Jamie, we have some final milestones coming up with the 3R project, which closes this year. He highlighted several of the things in the RDA toolkit release, but one thing he did not mention is our expectation that we'll, we will be mapping RDA elements to LRM elements as part of this release as well. You've also heard several people talk about the switchover date of December 15th, 2020. Now, no one ever expected anyone to implement the new RDA on that date. It is simply a switch over from it becoming beta to becoming official. And that had to happen before anybody can adopt it in the first place. 
So as you heard from Jamie, the beta toolkit ceases being beta and becomes the authorized version, and you will get it at the usual URL where you get the original toolkit now. Now, I was surprised to learn that my next point here on this slide is not necessarily true. Um, I thought the new URL for the new toolkit, the original toolkit, would be original.rdhtoolkit.org, but as you heard Jamie say earlier, he hasn't finalized that. So keep an eye out for news. It will still be available for sure at some different address. And there's no date set yet for retiring the original toolkit. This will happen sometime. But it will not happen until the RSC and the RDA board both agree that the time is ready. And as Jamie mentioned, you will have at least a one-year notification of when that happens, and then a countdown clock will start on the original toolkit site, so you can excitedly count down the days until it disappears. Now, the time frame for implementation, don't panic. Do not panic. It is not something that has to happen anytime soon, when you might need to panic is when that countdown clock is about a month away and you haven't dealt with it yet. So when you're going to implement RDA in the new version, it's very clear what you've heard from other people. It's going to be up to your communities, and it will be based on the availability of their own application profiles, their policy statements, their best practices, their completion of local training initiatives, and it might also be something that some communities will be interested in additional RDA-related content designation in Mark 21, BibFrame, or some other encoding standard. As you've heard Thomas say, some of the things related to representative expressions do not yet have a home in Mark 21. There may be a coordinated implementation date of the new RDA among some national libraries worldwide. This did happen with the original RDA when a number of national libraries said, okay, this is the date we're doing it but it won't be world, a worldwide implementation date for sure. So a few things to remember, as Stephen made just very clear, RDA has never been designed to meet all of your metadata needs. Right up front, we say that there are certain things that are out of scope for RDA, including administrative metadata, resource management metadata, and rights management metadata. And subject access, if it's not for an RDA entity, is also out of scope for RDA. RDA is about description and access of things of bibliographic interest. It is not a one-stop shop for all of your metadata needs. It can point out to other standards with the related entity of RDA entity or something more elements that are more specific, such as related entity of agent, related entity of place, etc., as attributes of an RDA entity. Now, you may have noticed in the beta toolkit that core elements are no longer mentioned here. That's because RDA doesn't require very much at the international or highest level. They're very minimal requirements. This is to offer a great deal of flexibility to communities and regions and to let different communities and format experts and whatever determine what works best for them. So the more specific guidance and requirements are still absolutely needed by catalogers, but they will come from other parts of things that are not at the international level of RDA, such as application profiles or policy statements or best practices. And another thing that's really important to emphasize here, just because an element is defined in RDA does not mean that you are going to have to use it in your cataloging. So what does RDA require anyway? Well, for a coherent description of an information resource, it requires a description of at least one of its entities. That's it, some requirement. So, of course, there are a lot of recommended things that would make this better for you. Relationships between the work, expression, manifestation, and item entities for the information resource, using the specific relationship elements with the appropriate cardinality, such as the following, expression manifested, which you have to have one, but you can have many, or manifestation of work, where you have to have one, but there's not a maximum that's specified. And this later one implies that there's an existence of at least one expression that's not being described as such. If you want to know the full list, it's here at the citation number on the slide. In terms of describing a WEMI entity, what is required is an appellation element. So 
something really broad, basically you have to name it in some way, um, perhaps with a title or a preferred title or an access point or an authorized access point, an IRI. There are many different choices, but it has to have some sort of naming convention. But of course, if it's going to be a useful description, you might want to do more than just name it. So other elements that support the IFLA library reference model user tasks would be helpful. But again, not required by RDA itself. So what will communities require if all these requirements are on them? And that's what Melanie was talking about in part at the decisions that have to be made at the LCPCC level. They have to determine for themselves choices and granularity. Will you only use agent or will you use a more specific entity like person? What recording methods in any given element are you going to use? One, more. It may depend on the context, but Normally, there are these four recording methods available for almost every element. And which of these additional elements are required and which are repeatable beyond what is already described in RDA itself? And finally, which ones are you just not going to use? It's just not helpful. Those are all at the community level. So moving on, you heard Thomas talk about what the RSC has accomplished and discussed so far this year, and you heard him mention briefly the plans for the October 2020 meeting, which changed from in-person to virtual because of the COVID-19 situation. Because our face-to-face -face meeting normally it is a week long and has a fuller agenda than our asynchronous meetings, we decided to expand the meeting from one week to two weeks. And we expect to hold two, sorry, four two-hour synchronous meetings at different times to accommodate the different time zones of the RSC members. All of us get to experience some of the pains of meeting in the middle of the night. We are investigating how to accommodate observers, and if you watch your usual sources of information for RSC news, you will ultimately get some information about how to do that. And we have yet to determine exactly how we're going to manage the agenda items. Certainly some things will be part of our asynchronous meetings held on Basecamp, but some topics may cross over between the two. Papers, reports, and other documents that are of importance uh, for this meeting will be public publicly posted on the RSC website no later than three weeks before the meeting. So for those of you who like to follow along, just keep your eye out. At this point, we expect to continue this quarterly meeting process with three asynchronous meetings and one in-person meeting for 2021. So let's hold our fingers crossed for many, many reasons that the COVID-19 situation improves and not just so that the RSC can meet at the National Library in New Zealand. And we have not set those dates, but I expect that they will be very similar to what we did this past year. So speaking of the future, there are some development goals for the next so 18 months or so. We expect to have some sort of continued collaboration with the MARC RDA working group. Uh, we are service consultants when people on that group wish to ask us our opinions about how these things work. We are expecting to see more proposals and discussion papers related to new RDA elements for the MARC advisory committee meeting in January 2021. We expect to receive and act on the initial recommendations from the RSC's Application Profiles Working Group. And we expect to consider proposals from RDA communities as they arise. Currently under develop by, de development by NARDAC is the Curator Agent of Work and its inverse Curator Agent of Work of, which may or may not make its way to the RSC in time for our October meeting. We can take these proposals and we accept proposals at any time. When you send us a proposal, we will figure out what meeting we can discuss it at, which one makes the most sense. It may not be the next coming meeting, but it should be within six months of when you send it to us. And finally, we expect to support a new RSC member who will represent Latin America and the Caribbean. And that could happen this year. I certainly expect it to happen no later than next year. Additional goals, we have an ongoing review and update of RDA to reduce and ultimately eliminate Western focus. Thomas mentioned this. Part of that Western focus comes from RDA's roots in ACR2. And as an international standard, we are trying to eliminate that and allow some of those community focuses to move to the 
the community resources area. So the community-based string encoding schemes, the SES project that you've heard several of us mention, is actually part of this effort to take an Anglo-American focus and put it with the Anglo-American community rather than imposing an Anglo-American focus on everyone. So we expect to have continued development of and support for community resources in the toolkit. At our last asynchronous meeting, we talked about what, how we identify what constitutes a community and what those communities' relationships are with the RSC. We expect to be creating a self-service checklist of conformance conditions. And of course, we always want to respond to user feedback. I think Jamie slit, skipped over his slide that said, feedback, we want it. Yes, please. Uh, there is a feedback mechanism available to you in the beta toolkit. We take those feedback comments very seriously, and we do our best to see what we can do to incorporate that feedback into future releases of the beta toolkit. So please, if you have something to say, let us know. So I'm ending with this slide of more information. All of this stuff is free. Uh, there's a lot of information on the RSC website, including a section for news and announcements, um, documents by the year they were released, uh, giving you the link here for 2020, and presentations also by the year they're released. Whether this presentation suite will be linked there or simply on the NARDAC subsite, I'm not sure yet. We may put it both places just so you can find it more easily. ALA Publishing maintains the RDA Toolkit site and the Toolkit YouTube channel. There's Toolkit News, there are instructional videos on how to use the Toolkit and recordings of RDA-related presentations. Some of the um, presentations like this might end up there. Other ones might be really quick how-to videos. And if you're not familiar with that site and you're wondering how you're supposed to be managing this new stuff with the Beta Toolkit, please take a look. I think you would find it very helpful. And of course, I am interested in helping you navigate all of this. So if you have particular questions for me, please don't hesitate to contact me, um, preferably at the RSC chair email address, because it's a little easier for me to keep my two different hats separate. And with that, we have time for questions, I believe, but I'm going to pass this back to Dominique, and she will manage the rest of this. Thank you all. Thank you, Kathy. So we did not receive a lot of questions during the presentation. I guess all presenters were very clear. Um, it's your chance now to ask questions. One question that um, someone said was several presenters have mentioned DITA. Is there a resource that provides a good introduction to that con concept, scheme, language, whatever it is? So Melanie uh, gave us a URL to where to look, and that will be transmitted to you, I guess, in, uh, tomorrow in the email tomorrow. And Linda Barnhart, the RSC secretary, answered, DITA is an XML schema. That is um, the back-end structure occurring system for RDA. Catalogers don't really need to know about this. It governs the markup for the RDA tax. Uh, is there uh, Jamie or Kathy or even Melanie? Do you want to add anything about it? I guess I would just say, don't panic. This is Jitta is the underlying structure that people who need to be able to edit RDA directly work with. So either RSC members, the translators, and the policy statement writers, and Pretty much nobody else needs to know the magic that is underneath the, uh, the how did it works. Um, I'll just add that if you know if people are curious, they can. It's D I T A. You can explore. Uh, you can read about it on Wikipedia or the link that Melanie uh, shared, etc. It's it's a pretty much a standard for publishing, um, a standard format for publishing these days. Um, can I just real quick apologize to Kathy? She's <laughs> absolutely right. It's original.rdatoolkit.org will be the uh, URL for when after the switch switch over for the original RDA content. So I apologize for my mistake on that. No problem. So someone asked, to whom may feedback on policy statements be uh, directed? So I'll ask Melanie to answer first, and then Tran, because I'm, I suppose they have different answers. So Melanie. Uh, 
that would definitely come to us. Um, certainly at LC, we have the policy at LSU.gov email account, which is a general one that would get shared out among several of us. And it is something that we would welcome, however, at a, at a later point. We haven't yet <laughs> shared enough, I think, for there to be a significant amount of feedback. And we will be setting up um, a period in which we're going to be deliberately asking for feedback. Uh, that will hopefully be when more of the policy statements are in the beta toolkit and can be seen by uh, other people. And so we will want feedback at that stage. But we're so will you quite announce ready for this? It. Will you announce this on the PCC listserv when that's ready? I uh, depends. <laughs> yeah, okay. not sure yet. It, we're, I mean, we haven't yet made a whole bunch of decisions about it because at certain points we do want feedback, but we want it a controlled amount from a limited number and then okay. there'll be maybe a later point at which we're going to want more feedback from a larger number. Since we haven't set those dates or those criteria yet, I can't really answer that question in any further detail than to say that there will be a point at which we're going to be uh, asking for it. If you have thoughts that you want to, re to offer right now, the policy at lsc.gov email account is probably the best one to start with. Okay, thank you. And Tran, do you have an answer for us on uh, to whom may feedback on policy statements be directed? Uh, well, right now we're uh, still at the point of uh, analyzing uh, the current policy statements uh, in the current RDA toolkit. So, so we haven't started work on new statement for the new RDA toolkit um, yet. Um, so I think we will have um, email address to address the new uh, policy statement uh, when we will have our implementation plan uh, planned out. Uh, right now, I can't remember uh, out of the top of my head the email address or uh, the generic email address for the standards team, but I think that would be the best um, email address uh, to send your comments to if ever you have comments for the current policy statement that are um, in the toolkit right now. Um, I think I can communicate that with you, Dominique, uh, okay. tomorrow, um, okay. because it's a very long email, so I can't remember it by heart, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, no problem. And uh, I will uh, make sure to communicate that uh, some way. Okay. So uh, Dominique, question, Dominique yeah. can I just add to that? Um, Certainly, if, you're not have, if you have uh, thoughts and suggestions on the content of the policy statements, you should do as Melanie and Tron said. Um, but if there's issues, you have feedback on the display and functionality of policy statements, you should use that submit feedback button at the top and let us know. And because uh, that's really my issue, that's my bailiwick. And okay, thank um, you for reminding us. Yeah, and even if you have, you can always use that submit, submit feedback for any kind of issue uh, related to the content you find, and I'll make sure it gets to the right person um, okay, that's very to respond good. to that. That's very good to know. Okay, so is there an anticipation of a testing period as was done for the initial launch of RDA? So I guess that goes again to uh, Melanie and or are you anticipating PCC to do something like this or will we jump right in? We do have a plan as part of our overall project. We do have part of one of the phases being a testing period. Um, however, we have not sketched out fully what that testing period will entail. So at this point in time, I would say that we're not anticipating something as large as the testing period that we did with the initial um, launch of RDA. I can't say anything other than that because we have not sketched out exactly what that testing period will include. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm being vague. I have to be vague because I don't necessarily have the answers <laughs> at this point in time. We, we have to sit down and sketch out very clearly a rubric, who we're going to involve in it, and um, what level of uh, detail we're going to be looking for. And our primary focus will be working with PCC, uh, but uh, we will con re certainly consider if there is a wide amount of interest beyond PCC, well, we'll, we'll look into that, but I make no promises. 
Okay, Trent, do you have anything to add or it's too early also in Canada? Um, yeah, it's still early. Like I mentioned during my presentation, we will you know, sketch out our uh, plan uh, in the fall. So we will have more details then. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is maybe for Jamie. Will any of the guidance chapter be available offline such as PDFs? Um, so, uh, guidance chapters, well, if you subscribe to the toolkit, all files are available as PDFs that you can um, open and you just click that print button and that opens a PDF that you can download and have as print. Um, our, I'm not sure if the question is asking, will they all be available in some kind of print format without a um, toolkit subscription? Um, and the answer to that, we do not have any plans for that. Um, we do have plans for certain print products, uh, a glossary and a new version of the RDA Essentials um, and some other uh, example workbooks, et cetera, are planned. Um, that will, you, uh, certainly RDA Essentials will bring into um, some of the guidance information to bear um, in that volume. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. So uh, another question, once implementation is scheduled, any idea of how quickly other documents will be uh, revised like LCDCM uh, Z1? I suspect that's to me. Yeah, I suspect uh, it too. <laughs> um, the answer to that actually is I would turn that question around. Um, I believe that we will try to do the uh, revision of the document external documentation first before we decide on an implementation date. Now, once again, I, I, I reference what I said up above. I am not deciding an implementation date. That is made by LC managers in, in, in cooperation with PCC POCO. I will be certainly <laughs> giving recommendations at certain points as the project lead, but I am not deciding that. So I can't give you an absolute answer uh, of how quickly, but I will say that that is part of our phase um, four or five, five, the metadata guidance documentation. Um, that is part of our phase five work, that revising all of that documentation that we need to, and we'll be figuring that out in, in a sense of this is the highest priority documentation we need to revise, and once we've hit that list is when I think we will be willing to consider um, implementation. Okay, thank you. Next question, how will catalogers not in PCC be notified? Who wants to answer this? I'm not completely sure what they want to be notified about. I guess about. About day one of the implementation by ELSI or by other groups. If it's implementation, then we will certainly be announcing that beyond just the PCC listserv and certainly will always be announced on the um, ABA website of LC, uh, www.loc.gov slash ABA. Um, other places, we will certainly try to share the information as widely as possible, uh, but you can certainly find it on that external website and, of course, the PCC website. If you watch it, um, it will be announced there as well. You don't have to be a member of PCC to watch that. Thank you. So again, for Elsie, <laughs> you're busy, Melanie. When Ed, RDA was initially launched, the national libraries gave quite a long lead time once the implementation date was decided. I think it was a year. Do you expect to do that again this time? Uh, once again, because this is an LC PCC decision, I suspect that there will be a long lead time, but I can't make any authoritative statements about that. Uh, what I do suspect um, and what we're looking at or considering is a rolling implementation date where, you know, we'll have a start date, but not everybody will necessarily have to implement on that date so that you will have time after it to incorporate um, in, uh, into your own training schedules and so on. Okay. Next question, I'm not sure how we can uh, answer this, but how does OCLC fit into schedules for the next several years? Are they participating now, or will they start when LC is done with policy statements? 
any idea, either Melanie or Kathy, what's going on with OCLC? <laughs> It's sort of hard to understand what this question is trying to get at. If it's about the new MARC content designation that the MARC Advisory Committee has been approving, then that will be up to OCLC when they are ready to implement that and they will notify everyone. And they are part of the MARC Advisory Committee, so they're definitely aware of developments there. In terms of other things, um, it would be more about the local decisions and the community decisions about what to do, which should already be supported in MARC. So I'm mm -hmm. not sure that there's a lot that OCLC has to do other than accommodating the new content designation that's being approved. Okay. Yes, I mean, at this point in time, I'll note, we have not had any need to consult with OCLC on the work we're doing. But I will note, I mean, we're still uh, far enough away from the external documentation work that that may develop, but at this point in time, we have not had to work with them in any way on the documentation. And their documentation is up to them. Okay. So um, my next question, uh, many of us could answer, so whoever is willing to answer this, what is the relationship between application profiles and policy statements? Do you want to handle it, Kathy, or? Sure, and then Melanie can tell me where I've got it wrong because she has her head more in this a lot, a lot more than I do. I think of application profiles generally as the work form kind of things that you get when you're creating a new record in OCLC and the quality control that tells you you cannot report, repeat a 245. Um, it is the framework about what you can and can't do based on the format that you're dealing with. And policy statements give much more nuance to that, may give examples, may flesh that out in a way that is more of a dialogue or really, I don't think there's much change in policy statements con conceptually from the way they are in the original toolkit to their function in the beta toolkit. But as I said, Melanie has her hands all over this and probably has a much more <laughs> elegant way of stating this. Well, of course, application profiles can differ a great deal, and I know that what we're doing is not necessarily what other people are doing. So let me just give you that preliminary. Um, the way we're approaching it is the application profile is where we are looking at each element at the, at the high element level, not at the detailed option level, and making those base statements that uh, Kathy did explain that, okay, this one's mandatory, or this one's mandatory if applicable, or this one is totally optional, that kind of statement. And then we're also going to, I think, be recording things in relationship to this is going to be related to this um, encoding scheme in the, uh, this field in the enco mark encoding scheme, or, or if, if we go uh, far enough, we may uh, also record the bib frame uh, field that is going to record it and so on. Uh, the policy statements are going to be taking that, that base information. It, it's founded on the application profile, but it's then going to be looking at every element on a policy by um, option by option instruction level. And also, we will be having some policy statements that are not necessarily related just to options, but to other more general explanation statements, especially, for example, in the guidance chapters, where we're going to be giving some background guidance uh, for, for ourselves. Um, they will expand on those things. They will perhaps say, okay, it's optional, but if you do it, this is what you need to do. Um, and then also this is going to work, as we noted, with the external documentation. So this is a place where we're going to be, that's where we're going to go into detail about how you do it in MARC. And here's the examples. And also uh, we're intending at the moment to have some of the uh, some background discussion in that out external documentation because it doesn't really fit into the policy statements, uh, especially display-wise. <laughs> and so we're going to try to go have a lot more detail uh, in that external documentation. But the policy statements are going to have the broad statement, um, sometimes the principled statement, and that is a is based on the foundation of the element level de uh, decisions in the application profiles. So, Kathy, our next question, is RSP tracking progress of cataloging communities and getting ready uh, by producing needed profiles and documents? 
So when, every time the RSC has a meeting, we ask for updates from our established regions, which right now is North America, Europe, and Oceania. And those groups are expected to report on what is going on in their environments. Um, and they can be anything from we're meeting four times a year and we're talking about this or this proposal is likely to come forward. But we do expect the regions to be reporting up to us as to what's going on. I can tell you also the RDA board, which I am a member of as well, um, asks for regional reports and they are fully staffed at the regions and they ask for regional reports at each one, at least at their annual meeting and I think quick updates at their other virtual meetings to try to have a finger on the pulse of what's going on. So we're aware of where there are gaps and what kind of things are being done. We um, are happy to serve, RC is happy to serve as a resource for people who are planning things and trying to understand a particular element or you know, if something needs to be clarified, that's, that's part of what we do. But ultimately it is up to those regions um, and those communities to make the decisions that they need to make. And as you've heard the constraints from Tran and others about uh, needing to have translations in place before you can, you really have to know what the text says in your own language before you can create the supporting application profiles or policy statements. So we're, we're tracking those things, but ultimately it's out of our control. Okay, so I think we're uh, getting close to five o'clock, so I um, will do the little wrap up here. So I think one important thing to remember from today's forum is that there are still pieces that need to fall into place before we can use the beta RDA toolkit in our day to day work. Many people are working to make this happen. So even though the switch over to the RDA beta toolkit on December 15 is just around the corner. Each North American community will decide on its own implementation date. Nobody is expecting you to be an expert at using the beta tool, RDA toolkit on December 15. It will likely take time for most, of, for most of us to feel comfortable with this new tool. That's understandable, but we'll be fine. And with time and some practice, we'll get used to it. So in the meantime, please consult the free resources listed in Kathy's presentation. Keep playing with the beta toolkit. It's fun. And stay tuned for an announcements from RSC, LAC, LC, and other North American RDA specialized communities. Be on the lookout for training opportunities and volunteer in training initiatives. Train your colleagues. Teaching is a learning experience. And most importantly, be open-minded keep calm and catalog on. So on behalf of NARDAC, I'd like to thank you all for attending our first online forum. I would also like to thank members of the ALA, of ALA Publishing eLearning Solutions, Colton Orsini, Hannah Murphy, and Dan Freeman for dealing with technical aspects of this forum. They've been wonderful. And my sincere thanks also go to uh, our speakers for their insightful presentations. I'd like to conclude by saying that we, NARDAC members, are honored to be collaborating with you, our, NARDAC, our North American constituencies, and with the RSC in the development of RDA. And please do not hesitate to contact me or another NARDAC member if you have any questions, comments, suggestions. And you can reach me at the address on the screen. Thank you all. <laughs>